Once men turned their thinking over to machines in the hope that this would set them free, but that only permitted other men with machines to enslave them. Hello, everyone. It's uh, welcome to our Dune 2 live stream, Time for a Butlerian Jihad, um, where we will be talking about, of course, Denis Villeneuve's new film, and I'm sure the previous one as well, um, but also connecting that with things that are happening in our own world. As that quote uh, in the introduction there introduced you to, um, there is you know, a, an important event uh, in the world of Dune called the Butlerian Jihad, where they attack the thinking machines um, and replace it with something else. So we will get into talking about that more and how that relates to, you know, the Luddism that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people who will be familiar with Tech Won't Save Us and with the work of, of course, Adam Bryan, who will be my guest joining me in just a minute, um, you know, have been have been working on for a while. So we'll be digging into the film. We'll be giving our thoughts on that. Of course, happy for your comments. Um, you know, we'll kind of bring some of those in as we're talking about it um, to pick up on that. And then, uh, you know, about probably halfway through our conversation, we will pivot and, uh, you know, not, you know, we won't we won't end talking about uh, the films, I'm sure. Um, but to kind of bring the films into conversation with these larger tech issues that we are often talking about in, you know, our, our various work on the podcast or, um, you know, in the writing and, and of course, podcasting as well that uh, Ed and Brian do. So very excited uh, for you to be watching this. Of course, this live stream is, is public for everybody. Um, it will stay up. You know, we've done live streams in the past that were just for Patreon supporters. Um, but this one, we, you know, we wanted to do for everyone, uh, you know, give that a shot. So hopefully you enjoy it. Feel free to, you know, share it around um, if you want to do that. Um, you know, of course, this is a, a live stream made by Tech Won't Save Us. If you want to support the show, uh, you know, if you're a listener, that's great. Um, if you're not, you can, of course, go to patreon.com slash tech won't save us where you can, you know, uh, support the work that goes into making the show, this live stream and the other things that we do. You know, if you don't have money to contribute, you can also give us some of your Chome company holdings. Uh, we'll take those as well. Um, but with that said, let's uh, bring on some of our guests. Let's get to the discussion, which is what you're here for anyway. Um, so my first guest is uh, Ed Ongweso Jr. Of course, he's uh, the Mahdi, you know, the Lisa Al Gaib, the voice from another podcast who will be joining us for this uh, incredible discussion. Ed, uh, welcome to the to the live show. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Really excited to you know chop it up about Doom and uh, Luddism. And Absolutely, our, and the little jihad we want. <laughs> we, we love a good we love a good jihad um have you have you recovered from your experience of of seeing the film yet is it still kind of washing over you in waves of yeah. spice or I mean I've seen it three times and I have a few more in me um I need I want to see it at least one more time in 40x I want to I want to have the chair rock me around when I'm on the world <laughs> you know and uh maybe one more in IMAX you know but it's yeah. still with me it was it's it's a really beautiful moving totally. the, and a lot of the images are just still in my head as we'll talk about yeah absolutely we will i i've also seen it three times um, oh yeah uh, i'm going again on sunday and i'm oh, sure yeah. i have at least probably another couple in me <laughs> after mm -hmm. that which sounds ridiculous like i i totally get that this is a ridiculous thing to say but i don't know we're funding I'm, dune messiah you know we're yeah, doing our yeah. part <laughs> i'm i'm bringing people with me who wouldn't yeah. have gone otherwise mm -hmm. like i'm making this happen right um you know, I I know you are, uh, of course, uh, our Quizzets Hadarak joining us today, but I am indulging in the water of life. Uh, right. <laughs> making sure nice that I am making sure that I am uh, able to process this poison so I can I can kind of join you on that level. I, I don't know if that means we'll have to have a, a sword fight later, um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I don't want to I don't want to have to kill you or to, to be killed at your blade. So uh, I'll have to put some poison on mine and you know, yeah, you know, we'll goes. figure it out, you know. <laughs> We, we'll make a new way. <laughs> totally. Um, now, Ed's not our only guest. We have another fantastic guest who, if you are a regular listener of Tech Won't Save Us, you will be very familiar with because I think he's been on the show more times than anyone else. Um, you know, he needs a little more love. He hasn't been on a lot lately. So, you know, we figured we had to have him on the podcast here. Now, if uh, if Ed is our kind of uh, our Mahdi here, I think I think Brian is kind of like our Gurney Halleck. You know, he's he's our advisor. He's our he's our trusted mentor, our, our great friend. Um, and it's such a joy to have him on the show as well. Brian, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Should I get my guitar? I don't have like the weird stringed <laughs> instrument that right. I could put up <laughs> sing some some uh so like, you got a little tail tunes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Maybe That'd later. be fun. Maybe, yeah, that'll I, come later. yeah. I, I should have prompted you on that. Made sure you had an instrument to play. After with. you're off your gourd on the water of life, I'll, uh, <laughs> we can start playing some. Perfect. Yeah. You know, and and you got the you got the hair, you got the facial hair to go with it. So I I think you're a you're a great fit. You know, for our for our advisor here. So. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um. Well, great to have you both here. You know, I will note note that. Uh, you know, earlier today, uh, not, not just recently, Chris said that, uh, you know, he had his popcorn bucket ready to go. Um, you know, I did not get one of the the fantastic, wonderful popcorn buckets. Um, I heard it was actually pretty hard to get the popcorn out of them. Um, so we don't have one of those to show you. But we have plenty, plenty of discussion to go into in regards to the film. Um, so I'd say, Brian, you saw it more recently. Uh, you know, you got out of it just the other night. Um, mm -hmm. What are your overall impressions to get us started on dune part two how are you feeling about it yeah it's you know it's good i i i'm glad to see it becoming this you know the, the, this phenomenon it, it like very much is its own like it really does have its own visual identity and its own uh real sort of like sense of um uh of what it's trying to achieve i and i thought it was pretty effective um you know, I, I can't, I almost, I don't know, maybe just, I was so excited about the first one and like what the promise of the world and what, what, what he could do with it was. So I got, I got so amped up about that and it's like easier. I, so I kind of maybe like the first one a little bit better just cause I was still plugged into it, still excited about, you know, the, the, the promise of seeing the Dune universe, but I don't know. It, it surprised me in some ways. Uh, I think, I think there were some choices made that I'm sure we'll talk about mm -hmm. um, both uh, that 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 did some interesting things with with uh, Herbert's original vision and and turning some things on its head that should have been turned on its head and some things that were left like weirdly kind of unexamined. Um, yeah, I I almost like wonder what 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 the difference would be if the first movie were to come out today because you know mm -hmm. we're we're here to talk about the Butlerian Jihad, which yeah. is it's not like. Villeneuve like d you know just missed that and uh, and just decided, you know but it's not mentioned by name in either of the films but its presence is certainly there you could like you I was just rewatching some of the first film this morning and you can really tell like it's like this very almost it's not anti-technological but it's very different than a lot of other space operas where everything's very kind of like minimalist and smooth and it's not all like the blinking buttons and you know like circuitry that you that, that dominate a lot of other sci-fi it's this sort of like you know very different kind of take on on uh on like what what an alternate sort of technology without anything resembling ai um might might be so i think that's interesting and i wonder if again if he had started the project more mm -hmm. recently when this was like really much in very much more in the zeitgeist that we would have heard it would have been maybe made more explicit but i i mean i don't know it, it well there was obviously that sort of like kind of weird sort of not quite uh referencing of the um uh, you know the 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 israel in gaza conflict that i that that's been pulled out when they when they bomb the uh the fremen enclave that that mm -hmm. felt like more resonant in a way that sort of the commentary on ai or the lack thereof um didn't quite seem as uh, as brought to the fore but i'm interested to hear what you guys think uh i'm excited to discuss this thing it was uh it was a hell of a movie it did yeah. it does just yeah. wash over <laughs> you and you do just kind of you know just just kind of submit to it which is uh which is always fun yeah i, I think i tweeted after i first saw it that it was almost like a religious experience like you know, experiencing the world and everything that he was doing. And especially, you know, because religion is such a fundamental part of the story and is certainly, you know, a piece of it that is central to the adaptation that Villeneuve did um, in, in focusing so much on that on that element of it. Um, and of course, he's talked a lot about the, you know, particular choices that he made in terms of what he wanted the story to focus on and kind of the pieces of it that he felt were okay to have, you know, go by the wayside to not make it you know, too confusing, too complex for a wider audience. And of course, I think I should say, you know, if it's not clear, um, spoiler alert, uh, because we will be digging into all those things. Um, if, you know, I, I imagine with a stream like this, after it's been out for a week that you know to expect that if you're a viewer, but just in case. Um, Ed, turn to you now for your kind of, you know, I don't know, your, your bigger thoughts on, uh, 
on the film before we kind of start digging into the very specifics of it you know after you got out of one or two or three uh, viewings of the film how are you feeling about it what's your what's your feeling you're on mute by the way yeah i really love the film i mean from the beginning that ambush scene scene is one of my favorite sort of openers to a little sci-fi story like this and the bodies falling to the ground and thumping yes uh, <laughs> is something is it was, was such a fun hypnotic piece um i think he is interesting because there are some I, I really like some of the moves to like compress large chunks of what would otherwise have been dialogue heavy info dumps into just like visual cues how do you ride the worm you know how do you um, you know, what's, what's the, what's the extraction of water like, or why did they do it or how they do it, they do it, or what's the reverence for various types of people, um, depending on who they are, uh, and their water. <clears throat> and I think I came away with like, oh, this is, this is actually like one really great. If you haven't, I think read the books, but also if you read the books, but may, or the first one, it maybe didn't come away with the right takeaway, you know, which is Paul being, of course, um, something bad happening for the universe <laughs> um but what i wasn't supposed to cheer for <laughs> right you know i mean some people still did but yeah. <laughs> um but also i think kind of more focusing on more of the world outside of uh computation right there's you get a vague sense of like oh well you know people have abandoned computation in the first movie because of the threat of AI hundreds or, you know, thousands and thousands of years before. Um, and I think like really zoning in on how the Fremen live life was really interesting though. I wish there was much more depiction of their actual lives or their social lives outside of, you know, some of the rituals uh, that we got to see, although those were really interesting, but they were like, you know, like you talked about from the religious framework. Um, and highlighting the reverence they have for water, the reverence they have for one another's water. But, you know, kind of showing that, you know, ways of living that are not necessarily some sort of primitivist thing just because they don't have computers um, and are still, and, and also surprise the, the incompetent uh, overseers that they have to the North who don't even know about the existence of the Southern half of uh, the Fremen population uh, and, and and I think like a nice little testament to like life, you know, still find there's still being other ways to live without computers, <laughs> even if, you know, not to romanticize a really, a really harsh life in the middle of a desert where water is scarce and you have to preserve it in every sh shape or form that it, it, it's in. But yeah. Think, and our vision for a future Luddite society is uh, in intensely feudal. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Right. But yeah, we're, we're here <laughs> shilling for, yeah. for feudal, for feudalism and then maybe retreat to the countryside with your little seat. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but I think that a lot of visions don't um, have no, almost no interest in depicting any like life uh, of the, in the future, except computers or no computers. And if it's no computers, then it's like mm -hmm. the worst, most grueling substance based lifestyle where there's no misery, there's no joy. It's just misery. And I think, you know, I, I'd like that the Fremen were not just reduced to some sort of tribal, barely able to live off the land uh, depiction, as I feel like other adaptations might have done, you know, or other sci-fi series do as well. Yeah. Now, I, I feel like my, you know, as I said, I've seen it three times. I, For me, um, I, I feel like Denis Villeneuve is like one of those directors whose aesthetic I just absolutely love like I think he makes such beautiful films that I want to go back and see them like multiple times in the cinema just to like have that experience like when Blade Runner 2049 came out I saw that in cinema four or five times just because oh. it, it was such a beautiful film to look at and I feel like you know Doom Part 2 kind of builds on the I don't know the learnings that he had over the pr past previous films not just like in the visual sense but you know to tie that together with how to tell this story in the way he wants to tell it. it you know as you say ed you know not to always need all this dialogue in order to illustrate what he wants to show um you know he's done interviews where he said that um you know he basically doesn't want to he, do, he doesn't like to do dialogue heavy stuff he thinks film should be able to really survive kind of with the the visual medium but then also to bring in the sound in 
you know, the sound effects, as you're saying, with like the thumping of, you know, kind of the bodies falling off the cliff um, of the Harkonnens uh, early in the film. Um, but then also like uh, having this great kind of score and soundtrack, um, you know, that Hans Zimmer and, and his team put together. Um, but then on top of that, also knowing when not to use sound, like when the final battle at the end of the film between uh, Paul and Fade Rautha is just like silent and you just hear like, you know, the blades and uh, all that sort of stuff. Um, like, I think, you know, from a kind of technical level, like, I think he just puts it together in such like a beautiful package. Um, but then the story itself, I felt that, you know, the changes that he made, I thought kind of made sense for the type of film that he was trying to, trying to, to make. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that he said that he felt that there were kind of when you go into adapting dune you can look at the Benny Gesserit, you can look at the spacers guild you can look at the mentats as like these different um you know parts of the galaxy or parts of this kind of political system that's emerged that you can focus on um and he made a specific choice to focus on the Benny Gesserit and not to look so much at the spacers guild or at um the mentats because he felt that it would kind of overcomplicate the story that he was trying to tell um, in the time he had to tell it. Um, I also felt generally that like the cast and the acting was like quite stellar. I, you know, I was not sure if someone like Zendaya or Timothy Chalamet would, you know, be able to kind of get to the level that they needed to get at. But for me, I felt, I felt largely that it worked um, and that they were able to kind of, uh, you know, demonstrate their roles properly or whatnot. Yeah. I, I I do think that like I, I agree like I'm in complete agreement that it's like a it's like a, a visually stunning film he did like you know he puts this this stamp on it where it's like halfway between his own vision and sort of the what's conjured yeah. by by Herbert and and that's um, you know a pretty remarkable achievement because it just never lets up there's always something inventive or new um, in, in terms of how he's imagining these whether it's the you know the Harkonnens planet or like the or the the chambers where they're doing the rituals it all very much has its own visual language that's interesting um i do think that maybe he does retreat too far into sort of the eschewing of, of, of dialogue like mm -hmm. um kind of teasing out what what ed was talking about earlier i do feel like it's not that he, it's it, that the the fremen are totally caricatures he does like do some work to sort of evidence the fact that there's, you know, disagreements on how, you know, their liberation project should be carried out. Um, but they still do wind up getting like a little bit flattened. Um, mm -hmm. And the one thing that I was probably most disappointed in is that in the book, like they actually, you know, they have their own, and, and this is an important point, I think that that was missed out is like they do, they have their own plans to sort of mm -hmm. reform yeah. to try to terraform Dune and to turn it into a habitable planet. And the fact that, you know, Paul comes in and he's promising the green paradise like he gets to as this Messiah figure at the end is like a shortcut over all the work that would have to. And there's all these fundamentalist people who have been oppressed. And that's really plugs into the fact that they're, you know, these people who have been suffering for a long time and, and struggling under uh, oppressors like the, the Harkonnens and the Emperor and then the Atreides. Like, of course, they want, you know, this. Of course, that sounds tantalizing. Um, to, to, to a long suffering people, but they had their own, you know, plans that, that I think what the Liet Kynes, that, that yeah. figure is like really sort of missing from, from the second half. They, you know, they had plans for ecological transformation. So a lot, and you're right, he really focuses on the religious fundamental, uh, fundamental, fundamentalist aspect and like the, um, in, uh, and sort of like the, the, the colonialism. And, and, you know, I think he does that, that stuff really well. Um, uh, but but it is, it, I I guess I I was just a little a little disappointed and like the, Paul's transformation kind of feels like a little also um, to me like a little bit under underdeveloped as like he just kind of he does he just goes for it he you know he kind of shuns Shani and then um, he's the he's the Messiah figure. Um, so I, I don't know. So I do feel like there's a drawback to that, mm -hmm. like limited to just like using relying so much on visual language and on on sort of the, uh, you know, just kind of uh, it's yeah, there's a lot to get through and you have to make choices. And he made made those choices. But there there is a uh, I do feel like that there is, a, 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 you know. Yeah, no, that's a good point, because you get you get that scene where they're in Siege Tebar, right? And 
he mentions that they have the water and they want, but the way that he mentions it, it doesn't hint or really communicate that they had a plan to terraform yeah, Dune yeah. themselves. It makes it sound like they're hoarding the water so that when Lisan al Gaib shows up, then together they'll terraform uh, Dune. And not that, like, yeah, like you said, Leek Kynes, who's, you know, his Chinese uh, parent, uh, yeah. Um, has which is this, not uh which is not a piece yeah. of the film yeah yeah which is but also what yeah because it's yeah. like that was a that was something they bonded over the book and that yeah. helped cement the romance or kick it off yeah. i think and not only that but it almost kind of presents the like the fact that they have this big store of water as this like religious fanatical kind of yeah. irrational yeah. thing right like yeah. and it's just like oh it's all down there because this is this religious practice that we have we would and, never touch it because of the religious yeah. practice. right no one would dare you know yeah. even take a sip from this if they were mm -hmm. dying so maybe maybe chani and her crowd like go down and take a sip every now and then to be like <laughs> you know we don't believe in this <laughs> right i can see that <laughs> yeah, you know, Stilgar's like, like, yeah, this is, uh, you know, the the religious font. We don't touch the, the that is, water. <laughs> that is that is a good point, right? That the the Fremen do have these plans. They have been waging their war with the with Arconans for a while, and because he wants to focus on how quickly the religion can sweep them up, I think undercuts it so that the stuff that's standing and that feels like Paul gets a grip on is like their religious lifestyles and their religious rituals. Um, because it's like almost every time that we get a look into their lives, it's it's either the religious aspect which scares Paul, or it's the religious aspect which Paul can use. You know, like when they're yeah, sitting yeah. and together and they're eating food. You know, the way in which we learn that their food has spices because Paul's just kind of like ostracized a little bit, feeling like, oh, they think I'm a false prophet, and he has a spice vision. We learn yeah. about the water of life ritual because they think that. Uh, the rever they think that Jessica can be their next reverend mother because of the prophecy. And so that's the only way that we actually get to look at it, right? You know, like we're, we're shown the lifestyle only in ways in which there's a religious aspect about to be manipulated or to be manipulated. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder what you made of some pieces of that. Like, you know, as I was watching it a few times, like I, I felt like there were pieces of it that stood out to me a bit more, you know, with each with each watch. And one of them was that, you know, it seems like Paul is really kind of fighting against this prophecy that is, you know, kind of presenting him as the the Kwisatz Haderach and, you know, the Mahdi and all this kind of stuff um, until they attack Siege Tabor. And then he feels like, okay, I just need to kind of go with this and kind of take it. And I feel like the other piece of that is Jessica, you know, once she becomes the Reverend Mother, um, is is very clearly presented as like, okay, we need to move this far. We need to convince everyone that this prophecy is real. Whereas before it seemed like she was a bit more kind of hesitant to take that path and kind of telling him like not to go too fast, you know, stuff like that. But it felt to me as though they were presenting it or, or Denis and, you know, the screenwriters were presenting it as though it was, it was in part like Aaliyah in her womb after waking up because of, you know, the water of life kind of reverend mother, process was almost like egging her on to like yeah. make her do more and and um kind of push this prophecy further and even when you know uh, paul sees her in a vision later once he drinks the water of life it's like again she's kind of like i'm doing this for you like i'm i'm trying to push this forward like it's like that fetus has uh has a, a lot of uh um you know power in in trying to push this whole prophecy to its end yeah i mean like part of the reason you know, it's interesting in that, like, and I'm sure the reason they, he might not have communicated is, is because it's like much more of an explicit plot point, which is like, you know, choosing visions where Chani and the Fremen stay alive over choosing visions where like, maybe he gets the revenge and stops the Jihad, but loses them, right? Yeah. By avoiding the South, he ends up getting much closer to Chani and much closer to the Fremen. And then gets in the position where he doesn't want to use atomics because he's scared that, you know, the radio radio uh, activity is going to kill Chani um, and also wants to do to strike a decisive blow against the Arconans mm -hmm. because they under Fade Roth uh, are competent and start and just wipe out all of the resistance in the north. And that is what throws him to the south where his mother has been you know, for the past few months, uh, ginning up uh, the, the the myths about him, right? And, and, and 
I'm like, I, I get why they might not have given us insight into his head, but that also is like one of the cruxes of, of the book, right? You yeah. see how much Paul's just kind of like overthinking, self-doubting yeah. because he can see all these alternate paths and ends up self-fulfilling some of them or the prophecies until he realizes he's like narrowed or winnowed the options and is left with a, a set of horrible ones and chooses the least horrible one, which is like tens of billions dead, but then still doesn't fully commit to that because he's scared of one of the inevitable milestones on that path, which is like losing Johnny right. and, and kind of makes everything worse by virtue of, um, you know, just falling in love and like not wanting to give that up, which is, which is good and interesting and human, but also like we, they don't, they don't t say that, you know, they, we don't get that. We just kind of get like a sudden <clears throat> turn, right. Where he's, yeah. He takes the water of life. And I love that scene where he's just sitting in the stairs with Jessica. And you can tell he's almost kind of like resigned or bored because he sees exactly what's going to yeah. happen. Yeah. But like more just out loud speaking of it, I guess, it's because it's, it's, it doesn't have to be spelled out, but it is helpful to kind of articulate. See that. how he's wrestling with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which you don't as much. Yeah, and that we should also probably point out to those who haven't read the books is one of the bigger deviations. Like mm -hmm. in the book, he's like, "Yeah, I'm the Messiah. But, um, I'm I'm like I'm not cool. I'm not comfortable with you know yep. how it's gonna." But he kind of accepts this this the mantle, and it's less about he's not really and and, and Chani is just kind of like, "Yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm by your side. I'm I'm for it." Um, mm -hmm. And so they they kind of introduce. Um, some of like the tension and the drama. I actually think it's a smart filmmaking choice because yeah. it is more compelling to see them kind of, you know, grapple with what the potential ramifications of embracing one, that a path or one of those paths would be. Um, but it is interesting the way that he didn't, that, it, that he did it and he didn't make it as explicit that like one of his major motivations, what that Paul's major motivations was trying to keep Johnny safe, trying to keep, um, you know, preserve that love and it'll be even more interesting if they do do dune messiah because yeah. like that's one of the bit like he knows that well not to spoil that one i guess maybe we shouldn't get ahead to see <laughs> potential <laughs> no, no, no. but he does <laughs> but, he goes but to great lengths to like to protect her even though he knows that something bad is happening to her and that the relationship is completely different by the end of this movie than it was at the end of the book so yep. it'll be interesting to see how they how how they how they square all that i think because of that I, I like that with, since yeah. we don't get the time skip, we don't get the years that they spend together, and then Chani being like, oh, "Yeah, of course, this is a political marriage." Instead, we get like, it's right when Chani is starting to feel love for him. You know, wearing the blue band. Yeah. You know, you clearly something is about to shift when he's when he has his vision and is like, "Well, I'm the Messiah now, and I've decided to embrace it." And not only embrace it, I went into like the war council and whipped up everyone into a zealous yeah. frenzy, even though I specifically told you I did not want to do that. <laughs> <You Yeah>. know? <laughs> I know that felt pretty because it was like 20 yeah. minutes. He's like, "Well, now it's time." Like, yeah, now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I did enjoy so it though, um, yeah. but I I would say I I think I I like what Denis did where he kind of gave both Chani and Irulan like more of a presence in the film mm -hmm. um and, and kind of more of a characterization than they you know got in the book but yes. you know where you where you mentioned doom messiah uh brian there was a a vision that paul had in the first dune film where he saw himself you know as a warrior fighting the sardaukar um you know in the the kind of grand battle that happens at the second at the end of the second film and when we actually see that vision play out um it's chani who was actually in the armor kind of doing those similar moves as we saw in that vision i was wondering what you made of or or if you think it, it's another kind of um thing that he's setting up here where in dune part two paul also has the vision of chani kind of getting her face burned with the atomics <laughs> whereas in messiah you know, spoiler alert, but it's Paul that that happens to. Um, I wonder if you think that he was kind of setting up another kind of reversal that he wants to do there. Yeah, honestly, I don't, you know, I, 
I don't know what he. I don't know what he's gonna do with that. I mean, Dune Messiah is when the books. I mean, they immediately start getting weird. Yeah. I mean, Dune, yeah. the first Dune is a pretty weird book, but like you know, it starts. It it, it starts getting 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 pretty pretty weird. Um, although you could see why they would want to do that. They can like bring Jason Momoa back because he could be like the this cloned gift clone but you know uh, yeah the boy's in every book spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah yeah he's, yeah what he, he goes missing halfway through the first dude book and then he's around forever yeah um but yeah i you know i i, I with a character know. named duncan idaho you know you just gotta yeah, he, bring him back right yeah when you get to duncan idaho you <laughs> you never want to get rid of that yeah um i yeah i think I think it'll be I think it'll be interesting to see because I think a lot of as a lot of reviewers and a lot of folks have noted that this is uh it, it's not even just that Villeneuve like sent like like sort of included more Shawnee. She's almost like the sort of like the moral conscience of the film and the yeah. actual main character of the film who, who the audience sort of sympathizes with as right. Paul becomes less sympathetic and more sort of um potentially uh genocidal uh which again it just which is another thing that just kind of like how and that actually is kind of in the spirit of the books because like so much happens in the last 12 pages of the 800 page <laughs> yeah. dune it's yeah. just like he's like oh well do the holy war like okay like boom like yeah. all the how you know the well when the i finished rereading it recently i i think i texted you and i was like yeah. it ended so fast i, did, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was really like there does. are a few chapters left and i was like how are they gonna wrap this up and i was like oh yeah they do <laughs> they yeah. do everything gets one sentence like and then the next yeah um yeah which is to say i i think that he'll probably uh villeneuve will take more liberties even than he did with the second with 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 yeah. messiah to kind of you know i i bet we'll probably see more zendaya as sort of uh you know uh the the the, the moralist because you don't really the weird thing about the Dune books, as like Ed has mentioned before a lot of times, is that like after it, it does do this weird sort of inversion on you where you think it's going to be the hero's journey of, of Paul. And then so you're like you're invested in a character as you would be or you would have been like a pulp sci fi character of the of the 60s or 70s or like of Star Wars as we know now. But then very quickly you see what what's happening here. And then it just like. You don't, it doesn't give you much buy like for the rest for six more books, you know, five <laughs> more books. You it's 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 all very it's 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 very strange. It's meditations on sort of like long-term um political developments and you know this uh, you, you jump you're jumping like tens of thousands of years at a time, and it's just you're kind of so now it it becomes far less like obviously uh you know a, a story that you could sort of convince you know mainstream uh audience goers to just kind of buy into so i'm really curious to see how if a spe if it goes beyond doing this i doubt it'll probably go but beyond Dune. yeah i can't I'm, yeah, as yeah, much as yeah. i would want it um, yeah because i really do think doing messiah I get why you you could end it there, but it's really you got to end it at God Emperor, you know, or <laughs> or really it's like you got to end it at Children of Doom, but then you'd end it at Children of Doom, and then everyone's going to be like, okay, well, what happens now that the motherfucker put worms all over his body? Well, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, ready. Yeah. Let me tell you, yeah, uh, yeah. Plus, yeah, we have I the technology believe, to do it. I now. believe Phil Noob said he wants to do one more to like end Paul's arc. And then stop there. Paul's gonna but walk then, off into the desert, and that'll be that'll be. I know this man. For him to be such a dune freak and say that's the ending of Paul's arc, it's not. I and I know he knows that. <laughs> I know that's. So I think he's lying. I think he's gonna. He's, he's setting it up with the studio one more yeah. at a time. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I would do. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, um, what, if he makes Dune three and it does the, these kind of numbers, then it's like, oh well, okay. If you, <laughs> yeah. if you push my hand, I guess I <laughs> have we're to going do back the whole to the series. desert again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So you know that that's kind of Paul and, and the religious angle. Of course, I I have to give a shout out to to Stilgar, um, who you know I, I love in the film, yes. who is like you know our religious fundamentalist, but also like incredibly funny as he's doing those things. But then like as you get to the end of the film like i think there's also kind of you know a, a tragedy in there as well where like he's so he's so bought into this prophecy um and, and to his messiah that like 
you know, w when he's watching the battle, like he's he's so invested in it. And when he thinks Paul is dead, like he's gone. And then when he realized Paul's won, like he loses it. And he's just so ready for the holy war. Like he, he can't wait for it to happen. And then when Paul says to bring the lands rat to paradise, he's like, yes, we're doing this. Like, you know, we're going to kill the billions of people that your vision saw. Like, I don't know. I think it's, I, I think his character is like one of my favorites in the entire, in the entire film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mine as well. Yeah. It's, it's he, he's a great Arab uncle, you know, and he's so funny. He's vibing. The, I, I, <laughs> I love also they do such a good job of that dime turn where the zealotry is so funny until yeah. it's not until you really until you see him kind of cheering when they get to take them to paradise and you're like oh okay that's not, yeah it's not funny no. anymore <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna kill a lot of people so another did you want to say something about Stilgar, brian no i yeah okay. I, I i agree i will i just i do you know i, I you, it's already a three-hour movie so you just have to like pick your battles you have to but like yeah you want I mean, I guess that's a that's actually kind of maybe a backhanded compliment to the to the film is that like you just want you're like I would you know I would love to see him in like some other context too. I would love to see yeah. like a little bit more interiority of like like what's actually going on here when he's not actually just sort of like cheering for stuff or hoping to see the prophecy come 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 one step closer to fruition. Um, yeah, just you know like what Ed said too. I just want I I wanted even more of the Fremen in like the non sort of. Uh, sort of extreme circumstances and you do get a little bit of it you get and and, and you do get um you you know it, it, i do appreciate that you know they they have harnessed this this technology um that is it, that is extremely advanced and, and they're doing something that nobody else can and you know it's certainly not condescending to them um but i just yeah i just i just wanted to see you know more how he like plugs into the society other than like this kind of a a, a you know, of a fanatic uh, rabble rouser. Um, Cause it did like the one thing it did, my biggest knock now that the, on Dune, now that the two of them ha have come out is that, yeah, it, I mean, it is an action movie. So like, you don't, you don't have to ask, but I, I saw it actually like, a, a, like the last movie I saw before this was Oppenheimer. And I like kind of have a similar knock on, on Oppenheimer, which I didn't love. Um, but I'm, you give way more latitude to something like Dune because it's obvious, it's 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 science fictional, it's like fantastical, and it's like yes. But like Oppenheimer, just kind of you know you you get like you get this this drum beat, you get the droning score, you're like propelled through this thing, and you're given like the visual language to try to process what's happening. But uh, Oppenheimer, I really found like was like just like a series of kind of like one liners, like almost like a series of trailers for that like stacked together until it made a whole movie. And then like, yeah, almost like to the point where like he's Paul gets the vision of Zendaya and the face melting and he's in, you know, Oppenheimer's given the speech and he sees yeah, yeah, after the, the bomb's been dropped and you're, you're sort of it signifies the horror but I, the dimension, uh, many of the dimensions of it are sort of left unexplored. But then, like the soundtrack blares on, and you're pulled on to the new, the next scene. Um, so I think, I think there's something to be said, and we don't necessarily. That's maybe more of like a film theory uh, or film critic sort of discussion than what we're going to have today. But I think that like it's a very similar mold and almost style of, of, of kind of filmmaking where you're, you are relying on a lot on, on sort of like very, uh, on visual metaphor and sort of like very uh, blunt sort of sonic cues. And you just like, and scenes almost kind of don't end and begin. They kind of just like sweep into the next one. Um, and yeah, it's, I enjoyed Dune doing more um because yeah it wasn't like trying to make a comment on actual history or the context or something like that but um yeah all that's to say that like yeah that i feel like also stillgar he, he's played like he's, he's it's a great character great characterization played really well but um i wonder if he does ultimately sort of transcend what he's meant to signify in the film mm -hmm. That's a good point. I, I felt like that, especially in the middle, like there was a lot of that kind of scene, scene, scene. Like I kind of felt things were kind of blurring together a bit. Um, I, yeah, I still loved it. I was still, you know, fascinated. Oh, yeah. It's um, a great ride. Yeah. It's a great, yeah. Yeah, totally. It's a reason um, they do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another piece of this, like every time I see the Benny Gesserit and hear them talk about, you know, their plans and how they've been like, 
going over 90 centuries to like you know have this kind of eugenic project where they're trying to build up this Kwisatz Haderach this like person with um you know the right breeding to bring about uh you know this this messiah or whatever you want to call it um I, I always think back to like the long termists who uh you know we hear about in like modern kind of <laughs> tech politics and like you know how they're trying to plan out for like the million years in the future and blah 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 and all this kind of stuff and like they're totally into selective breeding and and choosing the right uh embryos and and the types of kids to have and all this kind of stuff to like you know move their their genetic line forward and and whatnot and like obviously you know the benny jesserit have been around long far longer than it, it, as like a story concept than um you know our silicon valley crazy people today um but yeah it it, it just always stands out to me and and i i don't know i i find them to be like a fascinating uh kind of group within this world and like the the role that they play in the politics of um you know these great houses and you know the the imperium and all this kind of stuff i love that that's, that's <laughs> really funny. like yeah i mean it's because it, i think you never and i almost wish this was a line that both Her herbert and uh and the filmmakers sort of played with a little bit more because like it's never like is it like you know who this it could all just be full of shit right yeah like, there's, like, there's always <laughs> right. that but i mean but then again but then then it's like oh well they can't actually control people with their minds and there is the voice like that we see that working to some extent in the yeah. in the film like i almost part of me wishes that there was like more doubt cast on uh, on all of that but that 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 is a really uh, that is a really funny point because you know by yeah. the end of the second film it's pretty clear what a noxious effect all this like this has and you know all of this is you know all, it's all you know it's 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 almost it's like a very it's very bleak it's all like you can you forget how bleak like this kind of wine and especially since they don't quite make explicit like as a as ed said like they're that, that like tens of billions of people are just like beginning to die at the end of this film like the universe is just is being cleansed in a in a heli in a, in a holy war uh in this jihad that it's like it's really horrific um what he intended you know to, to to do with this and where he intended it to go um and the you know the Bene Gesserit are like well you know we're finding that path for like you know long term and so even if like a lot of people die it'll be okay yeah so yeah the EA thing is like a really funny funny plug in there I just see Grimes in like one of those outfits like you know talking about how they're planning uh <laughs> to, to make sure they have the right bloodlines and like all this because i can't see like obviously it's a it's a women's thing right and there, there's not so many women to point to in silicon valley but like grimes has certainly been like elon pilled um yeah so yeah i think yeah it, it's really interesting also because it's like now it feels like now more than then we are starting to get back to we're getting towards like silicon valley beliefs mm. that would meld well with that right this sort of um idea that if you can create a person that lives forever or lives for a much longer time plus has things in their brain which are about as close to computation as you can get and then and i feel like a good part of the eugenics program is like okay well we can't create computers or we can't create ai yeah. but we can like use other memories to function as like the sort of parallel processing power for you and by virtue of that make you as close to a computer as possible while still having a flesh body um and here we have silicon valley being like you know let's do uh eugenics let's do biometric surveillance on ourselves let's um you know let's try to achieve senescence senescence whatever the fuck it is where you extend the telomeres at the end um, <laughs> to, uh, to to make sure that cellular division doesn't uh eventually result in you know mistakes and mutations um and cell death there's um there's there, there's this weird attempt to make an uber mensch that converges with a lot of what the Bene Gesserit have though i think you know herbert was onto a different was trying to make a different point with having um you know the Bene Gesserit and the voice and, and these sort of modes of control versus where it feels like silicon valley is just more or less interested in doing it one because it came two because this aligns with the vision that they have which also aligns with the nightmare of dune right this like strict caste based genetics rule eugenics rule with uh with stable unstable political arrangements 
where you have a tripod of institutions and they all hate each other in one way or another, but they're all being puppeteered by one specific uh, secret society that is um, for the good of mankind doing eugenics and for the good of mankind, do, <laughs> you know, maintaining this pretty horrible system. Because that's also the other thing, right? They don't ever, I, I don't remember if the books articulate why they want the Kwisatz Haderach other than like this is just like a form of power that no one's ever had before and we will yeah. be more powerful it's like okay why do, do you why do you want to give birth to God you know why do you want <laughs> yeah why because <laughs> we can because like all these Silicon Valley guys trying to make AGI like why yeah. uh because it's inevitable and we must yeah the funny thing though about that comparison uh, is that like the 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 Bene Gesserit like they have like so much more like discipline yeah and like <laughs> vision, like like the silicon valley guys are just like you know like i want to live as long as possible i want to like, give me my survival mm -hmm. bunker get me to mars like, yeah there's no all little goblins you know yeah. i think that's yeah. that, is, that is the big difference there are a few of them that i think style themselves as disciplined ideologues or disciplined yeah. long-term places yeah. like that you know yeah. teal and his People mentors like yeah. and his inspirations is like cultivating a network and uh it, they're not, uh, just, <laughs> you know, they're still petulant children and they still also have to deal with like the fact of the matter, which is like, you know, in Dune, the societies are all more or less aligned on the same political program, whereas here they're still in the very early stages of the of a counter revolution in the first stage. It's like, how do we convince people we don't need liberalism? You know, how do we convince people we don't they don't? need democracy that they don't need uh this package of rights you know and 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 from then you know once we win that war making it permanent and then going and marching on forward right so they're still in the very early stages uh and can be nipped in the bud yeah, unlike the yeah. benedict we're like even by the end of the dune series the benedict are kind of part of the solution even though they've created all of this <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, even though they're scheming malevol malevolently through the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it is, and that, and this is probably like a good uh, sort of segue into the, yeah. the the Butlerian Jihad, which were which is sort of like the overarching uh, theme that we that we want to we want to talk about today, which is that. Um, and I, I the, and the thing probably, but more than anything that I'm interested in talking with both of you about is is whether uh, is, is how do we even conceive or like sort of position the, the the Valerian Jihad in terms of sort of this is like all, you know, the result of you know the this this other path where computers and compute computation and uh, artificial intelligence and thinking machines have been banished and we get this this like totally sort of bizarre feudal society where just like you know galactic genocides unfurl and it seems like also a pretty uh pretty 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 nasty situation there too um and yeah and like what do we make of the fact that uh that it that it that it has been sort of stricken like from the record so to speak of these films at this time where like it's like Valerian Jihad is not like talked about a lot or in great detail it just like pops in they're at the books as you as you both know but it is also yeah. like foundational it's on like page 11 of the book or whatever page 13 it's like here's why things are as they are it's because of this and it's because of that quote that you gave up front mm -hmm. and they're quoting from like it's something that everybody understands it's something that informs uh everybody so i i, I just to hijack uh, your podcast for a second <laughs> uh, what what do you what do you we're having a make? collective discussion here so there we go yeah so what do we make of the fact that a it's uh, the 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 name and the idea is never made explicit in either of these films and then be like you know that this sort of like twisted galactic society is the result of the, of this thing that uh, this idea that has a lot to recommend it yeah uh, i think it's you know i think it's an interesting choice i think it's not entirely surprising given like we were saying how villeneuve likes to um you know what really focus on uh, not putting so much dialogue and just kind of 
showing things wherever he can. Um, so you do see, you know, the Mantat in the first film through Fear Howat kind of doing the computation. And of course, the Harkonnen one as well, um, you know, kind of doing the mental computation. And you get that image there of like, okay, the human is the computer. What does that actually mean? Um, but you don't get the explicit kind of detailing of why, um, you know, the society is like this and what led to there not being computers all around, you know, what, what led to, you know, this particular development of these technologies and why spice and, you know, the drugs that kind of make your uh, brain start to act like that have become such an important substance. It, um, is, it is interesting to me that he did omit that though, right? Because there yeah. is in the very first, in the first movie, there's that, there's that scene like really early on. It's just like very clearly an expo exposition dump where he's like, he's got like an iPad and he's like, huh, like, you know, and it's like, the Fremen live on Arrakis and they control the spice, which makes interplanetary space travel possible. Like you could have, you yeah. could have just had like, I mean, and a lot of filmmakers probably would have just had like the next scene being like, this is necessarily be necessary because of the Valerian Jihad and the year blah, 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 where, and you can like a little grainy, you know, shot of, of robots, just like, right. Like <laughs> Ned Ludd, like yeah, over the right, big yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm just curious. I, I mean, I would love to, I, I was, I would love to, to, to get obviously Denis Villeneuve's thoughts on, on, on this, but I, you know, I, I, I wonder if that, if he ever considered putting it into the, into the film more explicitly, or if, uh, or if again, if he would, if he would do it today, now that it's just like such a hot button and some studio exec would probably be like, well, are you going to like, what do you, what does this have to say about AI? Are you going to, yeah. yeah. right. <laughs> I don't think it needs to be in there for the record. I'm just curious what you guys make of the choice. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, part of me thinks it's like also cause, I feel like he cuts also to the bone things that don't directly go along with the plot. It's like he cut the Mentats, even though they have a role. They're in the first one. Yeah, they're, yeah. In, the fir they're the, in the first one. There were, there were scenes in the second one, but they were cut. Yeah, right. And because yeah. cause it's after, after uh, it's, it, it's, it's what would be the second half of the book, right? That the Trades Mentat is working for uh, the Arconids, right? And that is also a scene that's important because it's like he shows up in the final fight, right? He get, he's, you know, Fade Rotha has that poison blade, um, tries to kill Paul through, you know, trickery, um, and instead through fear dies in Paul's arms, right? You know, but uh, he cuts him in that whole arc because, he, of course, he goes in a different direction with the ending. So I don't know. I think, you know, part of me feels like if it doesn't have a direct reference to a plot engine or a plot gear, then he gets rid of it, which is a shame because it would just also be fun to have that explicit, more explicitly excavated. I mean, yeah. I think the world is so alien enough that people, you know, when they look at for Dune explainers or when they try to see why the world is the way that it is, come across almost in the first, or if not the first sentence, first paragraph, some explanation that ties it back to the Butlerian Jihad. But it would be nice for the, it would be fun for the film, if only to have that be something that's a little bit more in the public I, consciousness and to have maybe some discussion of it. Yeah, I think, because I think it's cool. I think it only enriches the yeah. whole thing, right? Like, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, this is why, you know, they, they have technology, but it's so different and it mm -hmm. operates so differently. And it's, it's sort of, you know, it, it engages with society uh, so differently. Um, it, it, I think that, yeah, I, it is, it, it is a really interesting um, uh, cho choice there. And I mean, for Herbert too, like, it's all, you wonder, like, to the extent that, you know, Herbert really had that, you know, as uh, as like a, a like a foundational or like sort of something that informed his thinking through it. I wonder if it's just, you know, was for him, it's a way to just kind of be free from the strictures of just like having to imagine like how technology would function in all these ways. And it's a really smart way to do that if you're you want to write, you know, uh, a, a galactic epic about you know men melding with giant toothed worms you know yeah. in the desert so. <laughs> and it's fun because it puts yeah. all these constraints on combat that then like yeah so many series afterwards copy but yeah. don't copy the rationale or have to come up with a different one right if you have a series with computers why you still have knives oh well maybe it's like ship 
to ship combat is like boarding because if you have guns then it will pierce the hole and you don't yeah. want to depressurize and do suicide runs unless you do and maybe that's a whole other <laughs> thing right yeah. um but all, but yeah because then you know it un like you said it is a smart conceit and it's one of my more it's one of my favorite ones because in general my favorite sci-fi is one where you know maybe there's some fantastical elements but i like i like you know when there's not ftl when there's not you know uh, introduct or devices or technologies that make it almost impossible to have like duels almost mm -hmm. um and that when those things are in are present in the universe um it's it's you feel it as a massive shift the way you would in our world you know if if um there's a fucking killer drone on the battlefield you know <laughs> that changes things necessarily right yeah. and how people approach the battle then if it's just conventional weaponry um yeah. And it's something that people just, it's something that people relate to. Like, look yeah. at it, even though it's not in the film and that yeah. it's like, it's like, it's like almost a, I don't know if it's like reached meme status, but like, it's a rat, like you see, you know, people are like, you know, but Larry and Jihad went yeah. on, online, all like to, 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 to this and that. So it's like, it's in the consciousness and it's something that people are responding to. We do uh, want to kill computers. I think everybody on some <laughs> level wants to hurt ads <laughs> uh, computers <laughs> you know, algorithms yeah it is playing I, it like even though it's not explicit in the film it's still certainly yeah. resonating especially in this moment right now where... i do think it's interesting that like the idea of the butlerian jihad of course you know these are published it, the first dune is published in in the 60s um and it's both of course the moment when like you have this kind of growing interest in psychedelics of course which is why you have you know spice and all this kind of stuff but there's also the increasing use of computers and you know the the beginning of kind of the computerization of things that are going on in society and there is you know growing critique critique of what that is going to look like and what it's going to mean um and so yeah i, I think it's interesting to look back at a story that is written so long ago to start to see these um influences and these this this kind of thinking in there at such an early stage because like we look at it now and we can say oh yeah we are angry with like what silicon valley has produced these past couple decades and kind of the impact of this highly commercialized digital revolution that you know now our social media platforms are all crap and the ais are turning out all this garbage content and like the journalism industry is like on its legs on like on its last legs and stuff um whereas you know these these kind of critiques of what these technologies are doing to society and like doing to humanity are not something that just emerges right now that just emerges in the past decade or so with like this most recent turn against what the tech industry is doing but rather is connected to this much longer kind of history of criticism of these things or or concern about what this this form of technology computers and then what kind of builds on it um is actually doing to humanity of course you know going right back to finding these influences in a book like dune yeah yeah no i mean, i think that's all that 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 that's spot on because you know i mean the dune was published what 19 65 oh, so yeah it's, it's like mid like, 60s yeah yeah the sort of the beginning of the uh you know of the first uh so-called computer revolution when you're looking at like sort of ibm as being yeah sort of one of the big and you know apple is not long long down the pike and sort of the increasing sort of the the amount the extent to which you know the the, the public is is aware of and or beginning to interact with with computational like technologies um and blow it up you know yeah and yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it, an immense amount. And I think, as yeah, I think uh, Malcolm Harris's book did a really good job of like mm -hmm. contextualizing the fact that like a lot of this is being done in conjunction with you know the Department of Defense and the war machine at the time, where you know it's all being put in service of. Um, so like there is there is you know and it, 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 you know, Herbert wasn't a wasn't was certainly not like a a, a lefty radical. He right. was he was his own sort of 
strange blend of reactionary, but you did at the same time have like the students for democratic society and people like sort of like uh, vocally opposing, um, you know, certain kinds of computation, especially because they were being used to carry out to help like, you know, pinpoint targets for uh, yeah. in, 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 the, in the Vietnamese war. And it, 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 and and you, so you can see a lot of sort of you know the rejection of that and it's what's more interesting to me is the fact that we had that like that that critique sort of like kind of like fell by the wayside instead of you know for for a number not not totally of course there's always been been good critics but like you know today it feels like we have entered another cycle where there is uh, a more widespread fervor for for opposing this stuff where there's more support for um uh, those who are resisting it um and it, yeah it is it is interesting to talk about doing and I, I would love to i would love to you know drill into the, the filmmakers might because again it just it seems like it's oh it's allowing this conversation to open up in some interesting ways but this the film really isn't necessarily about that it's about you know, yeah. the, the the religious fundamentalism and colonialism which also have a lot of you know resonance today of course I need to like put in a request to see if Dylan, Denis Villeneuve will uh, yeah. do an interview with me. <laughs> I'm on the pod, Denis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be a laugh. I, I'd be up for it. Um, you, you know, I, I guess kind of refocusing on, on what, you know, you're both talking about, what we're all talking about. Um, you know, th this notion of the Butlerian Jihad is, you know, this important plot point in the Dune universe that happens 10,000 years before the, you know, the, the story that Frank Herbert is telling in the first Dune and in the books that come after. And of course, you know, his son writes a whole load of books later too, writes one specifically about the Butlerian Jihad. I think that there is like debate about how canonical, um, you know, his telling of the Butlerian Jihad is and, and how that kind of relates to what Frank Herbert himself imagined the Butlerian Jihad as being, because um, I know uh, Brian Herbert, the son, introduces like a bunch of mechs and things like, I haven't read the book, but I've read a bit about it. Um, but anyway, you know, the notion is that, you know, these these computers, you know, these these technologies that we're familiar with today are reaching this point. And of course, both of you feel free to correct me or, or add to this, but, um, you know, reaching this point basically where, you know, they're, they're basically called thinking machines in the book where they are reaching this level where they are kind of intelligent, they're taking over, they they are um, commanding this increasing power. Um, you know, think of kind of what Sam Altman and people like that are talking about today when they when they talk about AGI and, uh, you know, the robots kind of taking over and, and whatnot. Um, but essentially, you know, this, the society, the the world um, kind of fights back against that, kind of defeats uh, the, this this vision, these technologies. Um, of course, there is a, uh, you know, what, a decline in living standards, maybe we could put it that way, as, as a result of what happens there. Um, but then, of course, they develop this alternative where they start to, you know, kind of develop these human computers who are able to, like the Mentats, you know, do these calculations in their minds or you know the Benny Gesserit who have these particular kind of skills with their minds and their voice and all this kind of stuff um and then of course the spacing guild that is you know what kind of allows all this intergalactic travel and stuff and they're like weirdly uh, uh you know they're like deformed uh, as a result of using all the spice and whatnot but you have kind of you know I, th I think when we use the term technology today we think of digital technologies right and we think of computers but in a way you could almost say that they develop a different kind of technology that is more kind of organic or biological um in how they're going to try to make this world work how, how would you both kind of reflect on that are, are there pieces of what i'm missing when i describe that what would you want to add to it well i would just add to it that i think that it the one of the most i think prescient things that Herbert noted is that like he in, in like the very few sentences that are actually like explicitly sort of de dedicated to de explaining the Butlerian Jihad in in the books uh -huh. he does make it a point to say that you know as you said in, up front that it's not just that like these these quote thinking machines arose and that's what was so scary about him but it's the fact that it permitted other men with machines to mm -hmm. enslave them so it was right. it's always a matter of sort of making the power more powerful, uh, giving them tools to exploit and immiserate others. Um, and that's a really key, I think, distinction. And that like separates it from like a Skynet type vision where it's just like, oh, we unleashed the machines and now we are fighting them. It was like, it's always um, a matter of, uh, uh, of 
of, of machinery or technologies or thinking machines, you know, tilting the balance in, you know, in sort of, I mean, it's interesting that then, which like that sort of, you know, points to a certain kind of like techno fascism where the, where, you know, the men with the most power enslave other people. And then in the alternate, you know, society where, where, you know, the, the people have really like done the Butler and Jihad, rejected the machines. And then you also wind up with another sort <laughs> <laughs> sort of uh, weird nice feudal fascist. system yeah. yeah feudal or you know fascist <laughs> whichever way we go there's no hope you know it's it's like pick your poison yeah uh, i wonder what you think about that ed you know i think i've been there's a series i've been reading lately it's uh red rising by pierce brown and yep. in it the I've premise, read the first three of those yeah, yeah i really like it because the premise is that the fascists win and they create a nightmare society and there's a revolution against there and one weird element of it is this similar commitment to not having uh thinking machines uh present uh it ends up they've recreated a roman empire and through their obsession of role-playing as romans this sense this vague sense of honor that compels them to not use machines instead slaves human slaves but a refusal to like let anything and in, in, you know that seems to be close to the verge of artificial or autonomous intelligence not exist and it's and in the series as it goes on to the you know the later few books they start to enter it's like this libertarian capitalist who starts introducing thinking machines or things that approximate thinking machines into the warfare and into the civil war that's been raging um it starts to shift the dynamics and how people relate to the technology. And it, and I think that, you know, when you have a sci-fi universe where the question is like, okay, what do you do with technology? Um, you There are like left and right reasons to end up at that same place where we don't want um, thinking machines to emerge. I think similar to like the romantic versus the humanist versus the materialist tech critic camps, right? That, um, Evgeny Morozov outlined in um, his criticism of tech criticism, um, right? You can have some people, maybe like Tristan Harris's and Jason Lanner's of the world who oppose it because they have this kind of romantic view of humanity being perverted by these machines and preventing us from doing um, truly human tasks. Um, and then also on the other hand, you might have objections because like in one way or another, they are taking away the autonomy of human beings or competing with human beings in this or that task. Whereas like there are the deeper reasons, I think the reasons we're, you know, aligned with, with this and why, and why it converges or can converge with Luddism is like the, the introduction of these, of machines, of automation, of, you know, algorithmic oversight is usually done in ways that are not, that have almost nothing to do with like, anything other than expanding production and almost in always in ways that, you know, come at the cost of the human beings in ways that we are already uncomfortable with, right? The world that we have already at the expense of people concerns itself with seeking profits and a world giving more armaments and more uh, capacity to do that is just going to accelerate that process. And so then the concern is like, well, yeah, yes, it might like degrade the quality of creative work. Yes, it might make general day-to-day -day life more miserable and take away from being a human, but it also just generally makes the world worse because we have a political and economic system that makes the world worse, you know? And we can imagine a political and economic system where you integrate higher and higher levels of technology into people's lives. And it doesn't have to be some fully automated, you know, luxury space communism, but you can imagine a system where you get rid of the drudgery of work or the drudgery of creative work or the drudgery of physical work, right? You can imagine a world where it's used to like, you know, to ensure that people have more leisure, have more, have more money that they take home or more resources that they take home. Um, but none of that is, in, or is pursued in the design, in the, in the innovation and in the financing of these machines. And so I think that why, even though Herbert's a reactionary, that quote and some of the weird ways he gestures towards it do kind of capture the essence of, of, of an opposition to mindless 
automation or intentional automation and innovation at the by the hands of or at the hands of people who already are have little interest in what we want in a society, right? They're interested in more profits. They're interested in more power. They're interested in more autonomy for themselves at everyone's expense. Uh, because that is the way in which, you know, power and privilege grow. It's at everyone else's expense. Um, and so Herbert, even though he's nuts, <laughs> truly nuts, <laughs> did he cooked with that. He, he hit that on the head and, and understood that, you know, in whatever system it is, if you're especially one where when people have power over one another, they use it to um, to take away, you know, take their autonomy away at the, or, or, or cultivate their own autonomy at the expense of others. Um, adding thinking machines, adding automated modes of governance, adding you know, s you know, ways of subtly influencing people just lead to the worst possible outcomes. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that he would, I mean, I think I, the vibe is, and this is just like purely speculation from just having read the books and a little bit about Herbert. It's just that like, that like as like fucked as the, you know, the Dune empire in universe and galactic oh. fiefdoms and everything is, it would have been even more fucked if, if it, if things proceeded, um, uh, uh, on on course with uh, uh you know with because at least this opens up all these you know these these vistas of like of like thought and like experimenting with spice and far flung worlds and you know it's it's intensely creative and 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 um and interesting and it's just like that you can you get you get the sense that like that this is that all that all that is in reaction to like things just kind of like being drilled down to like sort sort of like numb dull like techno fascism like and that's kind of uh you know what needed what, what needed to be to be blown up mm -hmm. um and i you know i yeah you can't count any of the i think his son's books as, as no <laughs> I can't, like i just I've it's tried not, to read some of them and like, no, if, like, I mean, everybody, yeah, you know, <laughs> he's trying their best out there, but like, it's like the, the wild thing is like, a, a Herbert is just like, he, like, I know you may not like him at all. You may like hate his writing, but he's a wild like writer. Like mm -hmm. he has a prose stylist. Like things are just like, there's italics and like things are just splaying all over and like, I, like words that are just sort of like smashed together. And it's like, it's, it's fun and it, it mm -hmm. can be weird and dense and it's, but it's, but it, and then his his son is just kind of like, and then they got on the spaceship. Like, yeah. you know, it's just like, <laughs> like I'm not trusting you to explain the no. yeah. God, I, you know, Someone you know. said that they have all this writing comes from like four floppy disks that of Herbert's notes. And they were like, this is basically the Book of Mormon. You know, this is just fan fiction. And where you're not allowed to look at the source material whatsoever, but please <laughs> trust us, it's there. Yeah. You know, like, he left I, the ducks behind. Yeah, I, I find it interesting that you know, uh, you know, kind of picking up what you were saying, Ed. Uh, picking up on what you were saying, one of the things that obviously defines a lot of what we've received from the tech industry for a long time, but particularly the ideas that they've been trying to kind of force on us over the past, you know, decade or so come from science fiction right this, this notion that we are going to colonize mars and that's the first step to becoming this multi-planetary multi-galactic species um or you know these wider notions of like how technology should be implemented in our societies whether we're going to kind of live in the metaverse or kind of be doing all these other things like science fiction is so key to inspiring so many of the visions or at least justifying so many of the visions that these tech folks are trying to um, force on us today. And I think that goes for AI as well. I, right. The idea that, um, you know, we're going to be achieving this AGI or that it's something that we should be able to achieve. I think a lot of these ideas are science fictional. And that's part of the reason that they're pushing us on us because they've pushing this on us because they've read so many um, stories or, or, you know, so many science fiction tales where there are these computers, there are these robots that are able to think like humans or act like humans. And, you know, they think that this is something that should be achieved and they think it's something that is actually achievable. Um, and they kind of hope that it's something that we're going to achieve soon. And so then when you read a story like Dune or see the films or whatever, and you have this, you know, this science fiction tale that essentially says, okay, you know, all these other visions that you have, here is a vision that it's very different. Sure, you know, 
the the actual world that they live in is not one that we would want to aspire to but at least you have this kind of foundational event that kind of at least says to you you know you don't need to accept all of these things as um you know, inevitable, right? That that all of these technologies are going to develop and they're going to do their thing and there's nothing that you can do to stop them. I think that there's something, you know, welcome in the idea of the Butlerian Jihad that says, you know, if you are kind of collectively angry enough at um, these technologies and how people in particular are using these technologies, you can fight back, you can challenge them. You can say, you know, this has no place in our society and we should think up something else in order to you know see what kind of our technological future is going to be because it doesn't necessarily need to be mass computerization everything has a screen in it and internet connectivity and voice control and all this kind of stuff that silicon valley has been trying to push on us for 10 or 15 years that we can have a different vision of what technology should look like in a modern society that we live in, it doesn't have to be the one that's foisted on us by these powerful people who see particular commercial interest in it. And I think then that is kind of, you know, I guess a question for you guys in the sense of, I feel like we're at this moment now where, you know, after this few decades of this digital revolution, where we've been having kind of the the building of these algorithmic systems and, and kind of pushing computers out on us and making sure everything has the internet in it that for a long time, there were, you know, even if there were problems with it, there were tangible benefits that came from it, right? But I feel like one of the things that we've been seeing over the past number of years that's just been accelerated with this push for generative AI is the continual erosion of those benefits that we are receiving and the increase, uh, you know, the continual increase of the drawbacks that come with it, right? You know, what we're seeing with journalism right now and, you know, how everything is just filled with garbage AI content and, you know, on and on and on. You know, are we reaching a point where it becomes not only possible but necessary to have a conversation about having something like a butlerian jihad where we say this path this trajectory that this industry that these powerful people have put us on is unacceptable is not benefiting us and it's time to think about something different yeah well i <laughs> simple yeah. answer yeah <laughs> yes uh, and live yeah. stream. <laughs> no, I, I, so yeah, no, I think that there is something powerful in it. And that's, again, we, we're getting back to what we, what we were talking about earlier, how we just wish it was like a little bit more explicit in this yeah. film. So it could be a little bit more of a touch, uh, touchstone for folks who are having these anxieties right now. And it was just like, because yeah, no, I do think that's a powerful thing that it's like, even if, you know, these, uh, you know, uh, e e even if a lot of what happens in this universe is, is, is not great, here's this rich alternate world mm -hmm. in which this vision that isn't being shoved down our throats does not succeed. Like this is a different, it's a, it's a different world with a different set of, uh, 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 of, of values and completely radically reimagined. And you could, you can, you can imagine sort of, you know, you may be up to the giant uh, worm human hybrid <laughs> being, you know, a different um, pass on that piece of it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, I think also, and, you know, the, the holy war where billions of people are killed. We'll but besides that. that too. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think, I mean, I do think that it's useful to say that you, you to think that, you know, we're again, we're doing a kind of a lot with, with, with a little of actual text here to go on, yeah. but it does seem that, you know, one point that you could, you could uh, extrapolate is that, you know, you know these kind, th these kinds of uh, of of wild sort of Bene Gesserit generational sort of searching for a chosen one or using mind powers unlocked by spice. Um, you know it, that 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 seems radical too. But ima but imagine that it must have gotten to a certain point, ten thousand years ago before this came, where there needed to be not just sort of it's not called like the Butlerian like resistance. It's called the Butlerian Jihad, where we know. The role that a jihad plays in the Dune universe, we know how all-consuming it is, and how bad things had to get in order to to, to see one. Um, so I, I I think that there may be like sort of a, a word of warning here that if you know if if there isn't you know uh, any sort of course correction or 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 actual or resistance or rejection of certain technologies then you know then then yeah like the equivalent of sort of 
blowing up server farms or whatever is something you know that 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 could well well take place i certainly don't think herbert is like endorsing the yeah. butlerian jihad as like a means of action i do think that he's like putting it on the table as something that could potentially happen in our universe if you know something like silicon valley has continues to accrue power in the way that it kind of has yeah, and, and just to be clear from what you're saying, in Malcolm Harris's book, Palo Alto, he explains that history of how people used to bomb computer centers, you know, back in, I think it was like the 60s or the 70s or something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they bombed like the HP CEO's the house. That... They, bom they yeah. bombed the, yeah. the CEO of HP. They just yeah. firebombed. Like, they, you were, yeah, it was a lot more dangerous back then. So they had the probably... names and addresses of executives circling yeah, around on the list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and I think we kind of forget that that piece of the history today, right? When we think about, oh, you know, we can't push back on these tech companies. It's like at a much earlier stage, like people were much more aggressive on these things. And I think what you say is really important where it's like, um, you know, if we're not going to start reining things in now, we're going to reach a point where it's going to be like burn this whole thing down um, and start over because it's just completely unacceptable. Um, Ed, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think we can definitely... You know, one thing I, I think is there need to be more defenses of sabotage. And I think we're getting there, you know, um, you know, how to blow up a pipeline and indefensive looting by Andreas Baum and Vicky Osterweil, respectively, are both really great texts that kind of just are trying to interrogate this idea people have that clearly creates a moral version for them with the destruction of property um, and viewing looting in a specific and, and and different arguments that come up looting as you know having racial animus around it and then blowing a pipeline as being terrorism and uh, counterproductive and uh irresponsible and so on and so forth right and thinking about ways in which you know you can kind of invert it and give people um the tools necessary and the arguments necessary to to actually defend not just you know i think the tendency what the tendency is to do now which is like if someone does it be like well i'm not condoning it but you can understand why someone's doing it to shift that, <laughs> you know to shift from that to being like well yeah they we should be doing that you know people should um be doing sabotage whether it's in their workplace or of a place that they think is causing harm because you know one of the things i've had a huge problem with is for years and years and years especially liberal commentators like to say that facebook is the greatest threat to our civilization or to our <laughs> informational civilization and then what's the solution you know uh call your congressman or something you know if yeah if, if this company which has an oversight board right yeah. oversight board, <laughs> you know if it's the greatest threat then why are we not attacking the physical infrastructure, right? I'm not, no one's advocating for what is, I think, the hard line, which is like, you know, hurting anyone. But we are advocating for um, disruption of its functions to impose that as a cost. And to that in of itself is a radicalizing act that galvanizes other groups of solidarity and experimentation and further direct action, right? Yeah. I, I think it's interesting to see that evolution, especially with the self-driving cars going mm -hmm. back to like the summer last mm -hmm. year where first it was coning and we're shutting them down. And even that by just like placing an or like gently placing an orange traffic cone on the hood of a Waymo car was enough to get Google and GM to say like, oh, we're going to find who's responsible and, you know, file criminal vandalism charges for gently placing a cone to then someone took a sledgehammer to them. And then a few weeks ago, somebody threw a firework inside one and blew it up <laughs> on threw it underneath so like that's like a that's you know we're that we're seeing like the the boundaries of what's possible sort of uh you know evolving um and you know in the face of i think it's important to note like utter intransigence from the tech companies themselves who are seeing things like this and then well and kind of unrelated but there was also the did you see the there's some the, there's like a german group called the, Vol the volcano group that yes. they cut the wires to the te the tesla gigafactory um yep. which is again it's been closed like, for a few days now yeah yep. Yep. So there's there's actual and it, it's actual direct action. Mm -hmm. And both of these cases are, you know, 
examples where like you can be pretty sure that nobody's going to get hurt you have a driverless car that's like holding up traffic and pissing people off and then you have you know some cables on the on, on the ground um so it is it is a moment combined with everything we were talking about earlier with the you know this this ai which i think is uh, the generative ai is a unique technology and that its social benefits is so minimal compared to like what you could at least you know google could like rightfully say like hey we're giving you access to the world's information like this is a new thing you couldn't just like google a fact and like find the the, like that that's new now they're saying oh well we can kind of like mash up some uh art that we vacuumed up into our database and spit out a new picture for you like okay great yeah what does that do for me you know like okay this can write a marketing email that doesn't mean anything to people <laughs> and yet it is this incredibly disruptive force so all of this anger is and i think i i wrote about this uh in a in a, in a uh, on my newsletter and it was i think that that's all getting sort of pulled up into these more tangible targets we have now like self-driving cars and then now like the the, the gigafactory you know it's hard to you know attack a server farm because there's a lot of security and that takes like coordination and but if you're mad at big tech in a sort of in a, 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 you know a more generalized level and then here comes like a waymo car like it's going to run over your dog and then yeah you you know that's a that's a target right there um i think things are are absolutely getting interesting and i uh it, and it's it's an interesting tea. You just like it. The Butlerian Jihad. It's not again. It's not in the text of the film. It's not like there, but it's it's ever online. It's like yeah. it's like become people don't even necessarily know that it's related to to Dune. Yeah. I've seen these people online going like, I thought this had something to do with like Judith Butler. But yeah, <laughs> seen that many times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll get her. We'll get her and endorse it. That'll be a nice one. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Close the um, loop. But yeah, <laughs> I I do think it's I do think it's interesting though to think about how these things are escalating, and I wonder when it reaches the point when we actually see someone like attack a data center or something, right? Because it's not just with the data centers; it's not just like they're out there and we're not thinking about them. It's like there are a lot of communities, a growing number of communities that are very angry about the location of these data centers near their communities because of the energy use, because of the water use, you know, it depends on the particular area in which of those are worse. But like, you know, I spoke to um, a researcher in the UK who's from Chile, um, who told me about, uh, you know, how a community in Santiago in Chile basically stopped one of these Google data centers from being built because of the amount of water that it was going to require. And they were worried because the company was so like um you know unwilling to share information that it was going to use so much water that it was going to force them back to using water trucks instead of having like water piped into their homes right like this is the real kind of level of things that people in some parts of the world are facing when it comes to these rollout of these technologies and what is required to make these technologies work that can you know be hidden from view but that a lot of people are increasingly waking up to and are saying like, this is completely unacceptable. This has gone too far, um, especially as, as I was saying, the benefits of this supposed revolution, internet revolution, whatever you want to call it, um, seem to be degrading day by day because of, you know, one, the AI push, but, but on the other hand, like just the increased pressures of commercialization and of profit making that are eroding even like the benefits of the Google search engine and the and what we used to like about social media and stuff like that. Like none of it can last anymore because everything needs to be commercialized to the maximum degree possible as these companies seem to be kind of hitting a ceiling with what they can roll out and, and the money that they can make. Um, and it does seem that we're at this point where, you know, we're kind of at a breaking point. Yeah, it does. And for all of those reasons too, I think you know it. It coal plants are like be or that were planned yeah. to shutter are being <laughs> their lifespans are being extended to to power these these generative AI firms and and it, you know it is it you know I argue I spent a lot of time arguing in my column last year that that like that that's why that's one big reason that we had to see this concerted effort to generate just unrelenting hype about like what this was going to do even if it veered into apocalyptic territory just because like it had they had to make the case that this thing was so powerful that we all had to sort of like buy into it now um because you had to get 
you know, the you 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 had to get like the the horse in front of the wagon because if you didn't, then people are saying, well, wait, what now? Like what now? Why are we like keeping? Uh, why why are we you know diverting our water supplies and like not decommissioning our pulp, coal plants? Like why why are we doing this? Um, and and it, it becomes more of a moral issue. And I do think that that's like that this the, 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 again this film comes at this interesting point where we do have there's this nexus where it's like being recognized as a moral issue, not like what does this technology mean, but like should we be doing this? Should we be going down this road at all? Like should we should we be countenancing the generative AI as like an endeavor as as what Silicon Valley uh, you know. For, forecast as its vision for all of it. it should it, it is kind of a point where uh where where there we can sort of view it almost more as a binary and we have seen some instances where people have been successful in um in taking the the negative right we saw the writer's strike say you know last yeah. last year around this and we saw them say no and it's not like they banished uh generative ai from the face of the earth or from their even from their their purview but they did oppose it and win um so it's i think there there's a space that's 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 open now and there's more people than ever who are interested in talking about this interested in taking action um i since since leaving the column i you know i've i've heard from i've been talking to so RIP many column yeah r.i.p <laughs> uh, critical tech column uh but but i yeah but i've been i've been talking to folks you know with the uh california labor federation freelance solidarity people are like ready to get boots on the ground and you know i'll you know uh, ed can be the george meller of the luddites with the actual hammer <laughs> leading the uh I'll, I'll you know i maybe i'll be the gravener henson trying to rally the cot the you know <laughs> in, the, in the pub rooms but no oh, maybe i'll have the hammer too i don't know but yeah, yeah well, uh, you <laughs> have a hammer also so, I, think you know. can, I think you can see the hammer yeah the, i can yeah. see it <laughs> <laughs> there was a point last time i was like I, i've just been driving around with like this sledgehammer in the back <laughs> Listen, like, see yeah. something do something you see a driver see? this car <laughs> It was funny in Oakland after the we for the, we did some Luddite trip. Yeah, <laughs> where we put put tech on trial, and and Paris and I went out to get get a drink afterwards. And I was just carrying around the hammer around Oakland just because I didn't, you know, I didn't want to leave it at the bar. Right. Uh, but so we were like, yeah, are "You open? Yeah." He's like, "You're gonna have to leave your hammer at the door." Though. Yeah. <laughs> when when we were in New York, I had to pick up the hammer to to bring to the event, and. Uh, I was like coming down the elevator uh, with the hammer and there was this like old couple next to me and they were like, um, what's the <laughs> hammer for? <laughs> I was like, I was like, it's okay. We're just smashing technology. They were like, okay. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. I love it. I love it. Um, you know, I, I think one thing that kind of stood out to me from the past year is when Eliza Yudkowsky wrote that column in Time magazine last year talking about dropping bombs or, or even nukes on data centers. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, like I would kind of be up for that, but for <laughs> so, such different reasons. Yeah. That, like, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> I'm not yeah. concerned about the AGI, but I'm still up for bombing the data centers and, yeah. and getting rid of them. Um, guys, this mm -hmm. has been a fantastic chat to, to end it off. You know, any final comments and who 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 is your favorite standout character in the film? Any, any final comments on the Butler and G had the Luddite stuff, but also give me your fave. I mean, Fade Rotha was just amazing. You know, Austin Butler, yeah. I've heard him slip into the Elvis voice a few times. Yeah. But it's okay. You know, I mean, there's a little, little bit of that in there. Yeah. <laughs> Mixed between Stellan and, and Elvis. I love yeah. how much of a fucking freak he was, especially. I love this, the the cut away from the room where she gives him the test was so funny to me because they're like can we control him we can control him with humiliation and pain and sh and she's like no actually he likes those things yeah <laughs> <laughs> we cannot do that <laughs> yeah i think i'm gonna go with uh rebecca ferguson i think oh, she yeah. really she becomes that yeah. reverend mother pretty like I feel like like that every few years uh Hollywood like kind of like has a round table and they decide they're like who's going to be our lady of sci-fi and like yeah. for a while it was uh uh a Scarlett Johansson she was in like yeah. Lucy and a bunch, and under under the skin and her yeah. great yeah. film mm -hmm. and her so yeah always held down a bit for a while uh-huh yeah. yeah and now it's very much I feel like Rebecca Ferguson between 
this and this and silo um and right. yeah i haven't watched that yet i need to do that the book's really good too you should check out the yeah, book i have, a, I have yeah. a i have a signed copy of one of his books i don't know if it's that one but mm. oh, yeah. yeah yeah i was i was digging like the it starts out a little stronger than it than it goes on to be because it, mm. you know it's a full but but it's I, it's it's compelling it's a it's a it's, it's a swing it's a swing i the one thing i do appreciate about apple is it's like doing all these sci-fi uh, swings um and rebecca ferguson's in like half of them so um so that's that that that's my shout um and yeah just a just another sort of uh underlining of the fact that you know this that what that that it's in, it's very interesting and very notable and i'm 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 glad we're having this conversation at this moment because whether or not the butler in jihad is in the movie like people have just gone to lengths to extract it from the movie from the text made it a meme because it's in the air it's just yet another reflection of sort of the increasing uh, warranted uh, justified hostility that people are feeling towards um you know what 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 big tech and and these generative ai companies in particular at this moment are doing right now so yeah interesting times for sure oh, totally definitely interesting times i I feel like it's so hard to to choose a favorite because there are so many great performances and like fascinating characters. I feel like I already gave a shout out to to Stilgar earlier, so I'll I'll leave him off um, because I I do I do love him very much. Um, I I still love I still love uh, Stellan Sarsgaard as the Baron. Um, yeah. I I think that's like such a disgusting and fascinating performance. Um, you know, and and he's changed quite a bit from the book. He's not like the the kind of pedophile that you have there so much you know he still kisses fade routha at one point um they have an interesting uh, uh relationship there mm -hmm. but yeah i and I've, I've just been watching the interviews with still and cigar guard as well like i just i just love him i think he's so fantastic um well, but yeah love him in the uh oh he's not in the next one you'll love him in children of doom oh he's bad <laughs> oh okay okay good to know i see i haven't read i've read the first two i haven't read uh past that so mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, Brian, Ed, uh, really fantastic to, to speak with you um, about all of this, to dig into it, to talk about the film um, that I'm kind of in love with and we'll see another few times. Um, and uh, yeah, and yeah, to talk about how it relates to the things that are going on right now. Um, of course, you know, Ed Onwezo Jr. is a tech writer and co-host of the This Machine Kills podcast that you can check out. Brian Merchant, of course, also um, a tech journalist and writes a newsletter called Blood in the Machine, is also the author of the book of the same name, which is the history of the Luddites um, that you will want to certainly check out. Um, it's over here on my shelf. I should have taken it off so I could like hold it up and, and show people. <laughs> uh, fantastic book, Blood in the Machine, highly recommend. Um, and of course, you know, if uh, you're not a listener of Tech Won't Save Us already, make sure to go to your podcast platform of choice. Check it out where we have critical conversations about technology all the time. You can, of course, also support the show on Patreon if you're not already a supporter. We have a bunch of premium episodes digging into Elon Musk and his uh, kind of impact on the world. Um, I'll also send you some stickers if you support the show. Um, so that's always a cool thing. And uh, just to kind of recap here, you know, I've drank about half of my water of life. Uh, I'm really kind of <laughs> feeling the visions flowing through me now. You know, I've, I've been converting this poison. Um, so Ed, you know, we might have to to get ready for that battle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we, well, let's do our little fight. <laughs> <in the tub. laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> awesome. Uh, well, I'll be looking forward to that. Um, I'll but, bring the hammer. Yeah, I love <laughs> it. I love yes. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but thanks again, guys. Thanks to everyone for watching. Um, this has been fantastic, fantastic, and we'll have to do another one sometime. Yeah, thank you for having us. This was great. Anytime. Cheers. Absolutely. Long See you, fighters. <laughs>